morning. We are half the Friedhoff family. I'm John. And I'm Peggy. And we've been members of Crusty Church since 2008. And I can remember when we were looking for a new home church in this area, we we're searching for a community of people that would be that we'd be comfortable with and would support and help us grow not only in our faith, but in our friends and extended family. We were also searching for a welcoming place for our two kids to grow in friendship and faith. We found Crestview to be the perfect place for all of us to feel at home and to learn more about what God has and what he can do for us. Well, our daughter will be graduating from college next week and our son will be graduating next year. A lot has changed over the years for us. However, our extended family at Crestview continues to be a blessing for our entire family. We are so glad you joined us here this morning. Welcome, Welcome to, to worship. worship. Welcome to the uh, Friedhofs. It's great to see you this morning. Those of you who are here and also all of you who are with us online, welcome to Crestview Church. As you can see, we have all kinds of uh, information about what's happening here in this church. You can go to our website and uh, learn how to give online, learn what's happening in terms of our mission and ministry. Sign up for our Beyond the Bullet, and I say it every week, it's so important because that is our online newsletter. It kind of doubles as our bulletin. You can find out how to get more involved here. You can learn about things like our starting point class, for example, for those who are interested in knowing more about this church. You know, who are we? What do we do? Uh, how do we govern ourselves? That starting point class will be next Sunday, 1030 across the hall in Gathering Grounds. If you can't be here in person, if you're online and maybe don't even live here, we'd love to host you. Send an email to me and we will send you the link how to get on to that. So, but again, welcome. It's great to see you. Let's um, prepare our hearts now for worship. As we do every week, we'll meditate on God's Word. And today we're in Psalm number 86. And so I'll read through the Psalm a couple of times. We'll meditate on His Word. And then we'll literally pray it back to God. So let's bow together and prepare for worship. Teach me Your way, O Lord that I may rely on Your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart, that I may revere Your holy name. Teach me Your way, O Lord, that I may rely on Your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart, that I may fear Your holy name. Gracious God, as we worship You today, we pray that as we spend time in prayer, as we open Your Word, as we lift our voices together in song, that we will learn Your way. Gracious God, You are always so faithful to us. Your faithfulness has been expressed on the cross. Lord, yet often we find ourselves relying on ourselves, and our hearts seem divided. Lord, we pray that You show us today how we can better and more fully rely on You. And Lord, as we worship You, may we learn to love and to revere Your holy name. Prepare us now, we pray, through Christ. Amen.
Today in our scripture lesson, we see the Lord with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we hear the Lord's words of promise to us. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, surely I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Our quartet will sing these very words. Amen, and thanks to each of you. That did my heart good. How about you? Mm, wasn't that fantastic? Yep. <clears throat> so there was an article in the uh, local paper this week about our moon mission history. Did you see that? Interesting article because there is a lot of moon mission history here in the state of Ohio. Of course, 
we have John Glenn, we have the aerospace engineering industry, and so I was interested to read that article. And so there was a long conversation about July the 20th, 1969. Do you remember that day? I don't remember it, but I've read about it plenty. On that day, Apollo 11 let the Eagle module away from the craft, and two men, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, landed on the surface of the moon on the Sea of Tranquility. What an amazing feat that was. And so from that day, we have all kinds of interesting quotes. One small step for man, what? One giant leap for mankind, absolutely. Do you remember what they said whenever the eagle finally landed on the Sea of Tranquility? The eagle has landed. And we've heard that over and over again. I was so interested to read about the reactions of those two men. But as I read the article, I noticed there was something missing from the description of that day. We read all about the eagle landing, all about how Neil Armstrong, almost out of breath, made that remarkable statement, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We read that they had a meal after they landed. Here's what we did not read. When Armstrong and Aldrin landed on the Sea of Tranquility, do you know what they did first? They celebrated the Lord's Supper. They, oh, they celebrated communion. You see, Buzz Aldrin was a Presbyterian elder. And he asked for permission to celebrate communion on the surface of the moon. Can you imagine what that session meeting was like? You know, he's having this conversation and he says, oh, by the way, I'd like to have permission to serve communion off campus. And they're like, well, what about having the pastor do it? And the pastor's like, I'm not getting on that aircraft. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. Well, where are you going to have communion? It's 250,000 miles away. But they celebrated communion. That's an act of worship. They lifted their eyes heavenward and they worshiped God. Notice what they did not do. They did not celebrate human achievement. They did not celebrate human intelligence. They did not celebrate human advancement, human collaboration. They did not celebrate science. They did not celebrate technology. They looked to God and they worshiped Him. It was an act of humility and an act of worship. They could have been tempted to worship so many other things. Look at us. Look at what we've done. Look at how great we are and great they were. But they understood that everything they had done was only a gift from the Almighty. And so they worshiped Him. Communion on the Sea of Tranquility. Isn't that just a fantastic story? We're going to talk about worship today. And in the context of our study on the book of Daniel. Now, the Bible, it's interesting to me, consists of over a quarter of the books being prophetic in nature. So over a quarter of the Bible is a prophetic writing. A prophetic writing basically says this. Here's what God thinks about this. Here's what God's going to do about this. So here's what you can expect or look for in the future. And so the Bible is a book of patterns. Over and over again, we have these writings. Here's what God thinks about what's happening right now. Here's what God's going to do about what's happening right now. Therefore, here's what you can expect or look for. And so sometimes when we read a prophetic writing, it's dealing with something that's going to happen really, really soon. Here's what's going on. Here's what God thinks. Here's what God's going to do. So look for these things. That same writing can also pertain to a thousand years in the future. Here's what God thinks about what's going to be happening then. Here's what God's going to do about it. Here's what you can expect. And so the book of Daniel is half historical, as we looked at last week, and half prophetic. And so we're going to be still in the historical this week. So let me kind of remind you of where we are. Last week we talked about how around 600 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, which is today's Iraq, invaded Judah and the city of Jerusalem. Destroyed the city, knocked down the walls, pillaged the temple, took some of the historic and religious sacred artifacts out of the temple, then marched a group of people into exile 
all the way over from Jerusalem to the east to Babylon. And among those he exiled were a group of young men that included Daniel, who was nobility, a 16-year-old, and his friends who became known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what we see immediately is that these four young men are faithful Hebrews. And immediately the culture comes into conflict with what they believe. The culture begins to press against them. And their faith is tested over and over again. And so we looked last week at how they got new names. We looked last week how they were tempted to eat the king's food, which had been offered to idols, which was in direct violation of Hebrew dietary law. And so this week we're going to continue looking at that theme. How did they deal with a culture that tried to take them away from God? A culture that was in conflict with their faith. Years ago when I was in college, I read the book Democracy in America. Did you read that book, any of you? Alexis de Tocqueville wrote it in 1830. He was a French sociologist and political theorist. And of course, in France in the 1800s, there was a monarchy. And he became fascinated with the U.S., fascinated with America. And so he came over to this country and he observed our democracy, our representative republic, truthfully. And as he looked at the republic, he marveled at what we were able to do, this grand experiment. But he also had a word of caution for us. He said, America will never be a great republic unless the people are good. And then he noted, if the people aren't good, here's what's going to happen. There will be a tyranny of the majority. In other words, the majority will oppress, take advantage of, and abuse a minority because they can do it. Because they're the majority and we are a representative republic. And if you look at our history, we've seen evidence of that. Slavery is evidence of that. The way women were treated for years, evidence of that. And yet we've worked through those things. And of course, there are some who say the tyranny of the majority could be coming again. And maybe others will be targeted by that. What we see in our passage that we're going to look at here in a moment is that Daniel and his friends were victims of a tyranny. The majority, of course it was a monarchy at the time, and the administration of the monarchy was abusing and oppressing this small group of Hebrews because they had no voice and they had no power. And what we're going to see is how they responded to that. How did the Hebrews maintain their faithfulness in the face of all that pressure? The pressure to conform the pressure to turn away from their God, the tyranny of the majority. And so what we're going to do is look at two stories today, and they, they really are kind of side by side. They're very similar. Remember, like I said, the Bible is a book of patterns. So we're going to see these two stories. They're about 20 years apart, and there are two different kings. So Daniel lived the rest of his life in Babylon. He lived to be about 90. He lived through four kings. We're going to see a story from one of those monarchs. Let's go ahead and settle in now and take a look at it. Here we go, chapter one, excuse me, chapter three. This is a long one, so let's just kind of take our time with it. A lot of scripture today. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 90 feet wide. That is one big image of gold. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. What is it about dictators that have to have statues of themselves? That's what he did. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, this is what you are commanded to do. you got to do this. You're going to live here. This is what you have to do, O peoples and nations. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither. Rodney, what is a zither? Have you ever played a zither? stringed instrument. A string instrument. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else know that? Not feeling nearly as smart as I did three minutes ago. That's okay. <laughs> the zither. I'm just trying to imagine someone saying, you know, I have to go inside and practice my zither. But anyway... So, as soon as you hear all this, all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold. Whoever does not fall down and worship the image will immediately be thrown into a blazing fire. And so what's happening is, these faithful Hebrews are being told, you literally have to worship this image, this icon, and that would be a form of idolatry. It's a command. 
And if you don't, you're going to be put to death. Kind of zoom out for a second. And let me just ask you a question. Have you ever in your life had something put in front of you to do, to affirm, to participate in that is counter to your faith? counter to your relationship with the Almighty. Have you ever had that experience? You see, Jesus said we are to love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our strength. That we give that to God. It's part of the Ten Commandments. We're not going to worship anyone else. We're going to love God and God alone. And so what we see here is Daniel's friends, and that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are being commanded to give the things they are to give to God over to an idol. Can't love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and worship an idol. You can't do both. There's an old term from the field of psychology called cognitive dissonance. Have you ever heard cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance essentially is when a person holds two beliefs that are completely contradictory. Or a person has two practices that are completely incompatible and you can't do both. And because they're trying to do both, there's this cognitive dissonance. There's just this disconnect. It would be like saying, I am a vegetarian, I eat steak every Thursday. You, you can't do both. You can't be a vegetarian and eat steak on Thursday. You can't stay, eat steak on Thursday and be a vegetarian, right? There's a cognitive dissonance. There's a disconnect there. It'd be like saying, I only root for winning football teams, yet my favorite team is blank. You see what I did there? That's growth. That's growth, right? <laughs> Cognitive dissonance. Being asked to hold these two competing views together in the same person that cannot live together. That's what's happening, y'all, with Daniel's friends. They're being asked to do something that they cannot possibly do and maintain their faith. So that's the, the setup of the first story. Now let's take a look at the second story. 20 years later, fast forward, Darius is the king now. Darius was a Persian, so that's modern-day Iran. So the Persians came in, they invade Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar and his son gone, and now you've got Darius, and Darius likes Daniel. There was something about Daniel that the, the monarchs appreciated him. The way he carried himself, the way he conducted his life, they just liked him. And so there's a new king now. And in that system, there were these three, almost like trustees, and Daniel was one of these three. Well, the rest of the trustees, they didn't care much for that. I mean, how can you have a Hebrew being in a position of leadership when we are now a Persian nation? And so they thought, we got to get rid of this guy. But unfortunately for them, Daniel was completely upright, very honest. There was no fault they could find in him, and so here's the story. Finally, these men said, we are never going to find any basis for charges against Daniel, unless it has something to do with his God. The king, he should issue an edict and enforce a decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days except to the king shall be thrown into the lion's den. So we've got a fiery furnace, now we've got a lion's den. And so Darius sees the pitch, from his inner circle and says, okay, let's do it. And he puts the decree in writing. Notice what we have here. In the first story, we have this, you must worship this. In the second story, we have, you must not worship that. And what I take from that is, there is a competition for our worship. There is a competition for who or what you're going to worship. There is a competition for who or what I'm going to worship. From the very early days of human history, God has had an adversary. And you can read about the adversary in the Old Testament. In fact, I'll talk about it more in Monday Morning Quarterback, Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28. But what we have is that God had a holy court around him. And at some point during creation a member of that court, and I can't even visualize you all what that looked like, whose name was Lucifer, decided, I don't want all these people worshiping God, I want all these people worshiping me. And so Lucifer fell. And we'll talk about that tomorrow again in Monday Morning Quarterback. And the fall of Lucifer, who became God's adversary, the accuser, 
the one who prowls around like a lion, the devil, or Jesus called him Satan, he became who he was because he wanted to be worshipped. There has always been a battle over who you and I are going to worship. It dates all the way back to the very first humans, the serpent. You think about what happened with Jesus. He is tempted by Satan, and what does Satan say to him? Hey, if you worship me, you got all this. So there has been this sense that anything that is of God is opposed by God's adversary. There is just this competition for who we're going to worship. Who are we going to love with all our heart? Who are we going to love with all our mind? Who are we going to love with all our strength? There is just this tension that we feel because we know we were created by God to worship God. We were created for His pleasure. There is a competition. I just believe that. Years ago, um, it's interesting, the churches that I've served the last three have all been near mega churches or campuses of mega churches. And um, I've always liked that. And so I remember when we were living in Charlotte, the, the mega church of the city, Elevation Church, opened a campus right down the street from us. And someone said, oh no, the competition is moving in. And I said, that's not the competition. That's, that's the same team we're playing on. That's just a different branch on the family tree. No, the competition is the coffee shop. The competition is the restaurant. The competition is the soccer field, the tennis court, the golf course, the softball field, the baseball field, the river, the lake, the bike trail, the walking path at the park. That's competition. There is this sense that there is a competition for what we're going to give ourselves to what we're going to love with all of our heart and our mind and our strength, because that's what God calls us to do. An interesting passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, check this out. So remember, we're talking about how there are patterns in the Bible, we mentioned that. So this is a prophetic passage that pertains to what's going to happen immediately as Paul is writing, but also what's going to happen into the future. The man of lawlessness, who is doomed to destruction, he's talking about God's adversary, and I love the fact he said, He's not going to win. He's doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. There's just this sense that for your heart and mine, there's a competition. And we see this illustrated so dramatically with the golden idol and also the prohibition, you can't pray to God. Well, what happens? Let's move on. Chapter 3, so we're going to toggle back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king, so they're getting him right where his ego is. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. They are accusing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And let's move on, 16 through 18. They replied, O King Nebuchadnezzar, so he's going to confront him. Why aren't you worshiping the golden idol? O King Nebuchadnezzar, we need not defend ourselves before you in this manner. If we're thrown in the furnace, the God we serve, he's able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O King, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold. They trusted God. They understood that eventually God's adversary is going to lose. Why bow before anything else? And so in the face of all that pressure as to who their heart is going to be given to and where their mind is going to go and where their strength and their abilities are going to go, they say, no, we're going to remain faithful to God. Well, Daniel has the same conversation. Check out verse 10 of chapter 6. Now, when Daniel learned about the decree, so again, 30 days, nobody else but the king, When Daniel heard about the decree, you know what he did? He went home to his upstairs window that was open toward Jerusalem. Three times he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before he was faithful. So in these cases, the humans are encouraged to exalt the human over God, to conform to the cultural norms and values over God. 
Can I tell you what I've noticed over the years in my own life and in the lives of a lot of people? When we conform to that, it creates terrible anxiety and terrible emptiness in our lives. At Easter, do you remember we talked about despair? And one of our church members sent an interesting email to me where he said, essentially, despair happens when we worship something other than God because we were created for God's pleasure. We were created to worship God. You and I find ourselves filled with anxiety when we give our hearts and our minds and our strength to that which is not God. Because there is a hole in our hearts that is God-shaped that can only be filled by God. And when we try to fill that hole with other things, what do we find ourselves in despair? I, 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 um, when I was young, I loved Penn State football. Oh my gosh, I love Penn State football. Talk about a transition. <laughs> love Penn State football. And when I was young, when Penn State would lose, it would ruin my weekend. My whole weekend was shot. Then they joined the Big Ten, started playing Ohio State every year. I had to change that a little bit. But every time they lost, it ruined my weekend. I know folks who are in constant turmoil and constant anxiety in their lives because they worship the wrong things and they find themselves in turmoil. Now, think about our lives. When something politically doesn't go our way, we find ourselves in turmoil because that's where our heart, our mind, and our strength is. When we lose our phone, we find ourselves in anxiety and turmoil. When the internet goes down, we find ourselves in that. Worry and anxiety comes from investing our heart and our mind and our strength in something that cannot bear the weight of those things. That's what happens. I remember years ago, uh, gosh, it's probably been 20 years ago, I was doing a wedding for a young couple, and I really liked them, and they had been dating for years. And it was going to be a humdinger. And so they were, I mean, we were ready to go. A week before the wedding, the bride calls me up. She says, can I come talk to you? I said, sure, come on. And she sat in my office and she said, I'll never forget this. Sean, I fear I have gotten on the wrong bus. And I can't get off. And I don't want to go where that bus is going. I said, tell me more. What What do you mean? She said, I've got seven years invested in this relationship. My family has spent tens of thousands of dollars on this wedding. The invitations have all been sent, and yet I feel like I'm getting on the wrong bus and going to the wrong place. I think a lot of us in our lives will find ourselves having that same feeling. I've just gotten on the wrong bus. If we give our hearts and our mind and our strength to those things that are not of God, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they did not get on the wrong bus. They did not conform. And so they were each faithful. And what happened to them? I'm amazed by this. Let's go ahead and go all the way back to chapter 3, again, going back and forth. So these three, they're thrown into the fiery furnace, and we all know that story from when we were in Sunday school. Nebuchadnezzar says, look, he's looking into the furnace. I see four men walking around in the fire, not three. Hmm. And they're no longer bound and they're not even harmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. I wonder who might have been in the fiery furnace with those three. Notice that the son of God not only delivered them from the fiery furnace, he was in there with them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to their God. My eyes are telling me the truth. Praise be to their God who sent his angels and rescued his servants. They trusted in him, they defied my command, and they were willing to give up their own lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. And then Daniel, chapter 6, here we go. So he's thrown in the lion's den. At the first light of dawn, the king hurried down to the lion's den. King couldn't sleep all night. Darius loved Daniel, and he felt so bad. But in that day and age, if you put your signet ring on a piece of paper, that's the law. So he hurries down to the lion's den and called to Daniel with an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has he been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, been in the lion's den all night. My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. 
And the king was overjoyed. And when Daniel was lifted out of the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. All night long, he had a ball of yarn and was playing with the kittens in the lion's den. Isn't that amazing? We see a pattern here that God is faithful to those who worship God. And I like to think that every Old Testament hero points us to our hero, our Lord Jesus, who, of course, was faithful to the very end. We are called to give God our heart, our mind, and our soul, and our strength. That's how we love God. We give God our our worship. Now, love stories of POWs who are in solitary confinement, and they are chained, they're shackled and chained in solitary confinement, and they're in this dark cell, and many of them will say, you know what I did? I worship God. I remembered scripture verses, and I recited them. I sang, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, in my head. And I spent time in prayer to God. I, I've noticed, and it just during this pandemic, and I don't know about you, um, but I have felt like there's been a competition for my worship in ways I've never felt before. I mean, there just was a time when, we, okay, we're going to have to shut down. And what do we do? And, and as a church, we said, you know, worship is central to how we express our love for God. That's what we're going to do. And so we spent thousands and thousands of dollars and literally thousands of people hours, people volunteering and staff to to make sure we could have online worship. And and I remember feeling sometimes kind of vulnerable in in the midst of all that. I mean, there was one Sunday in, gosh, it's been March of 2020. We had just, you know, the pandemic had hit. And so we had our crew coming in here to do the online worship. And, and Rodney, you probably remember, there was a strange car in the parking lot, and the engine was running. And I drove by, I thought, that's odd, I wonder who that is. And then the car drove slowly around the church, and I saw it out my window and watched it go by. Next Sunday, it was kind of nondescript, the windows were dark. Next Sunday, I pull in, and the car is parked right over here, and I think, that's the same car, and the engine's running. And so I pulled up to the car, so it was driver's side window to driver's side window, rolled my window down and smiled, and the car literally gunned it and zoomed off. What's going on? And then the next Sunday, I'm getting out of my car over here where our offices are, and out of the corner of my eye, I catch something, and that same car is over at that used car lot staring toward our church. What's going on? And so I just had this feeling there was this kind of this competition. What's, what's going on? And so what we've seen is that there are hackers who want to get into our network because it's growing so fast. And we're spending thousands of dollars. What I'm trying to say is that there is indeed a competition for where our hearts and minds are going to go. And I'm just grateful to be a part of this church because I talked to my buddies and they've really had a tough time. And this church has, has made me and I know Rodney and our whole staff feel so supported that we've had a healthy respect for the health and safety of our congregation but we've also not lived in fear. And we've been able to worship together, whether online or here. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever considered this? Or ask yourself this, how do I know who I am worshiping? How do I know where my worship is? How do I know if I am loving God? And the answer for me is kind of simple. I go back to Jesus' great command. And I've said it five times today. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength. And so ask yourself, this is why I like to keep a journal. Am I loving God with my heart? In other words, where are my affections? Where are my passions? Where are my emotions? Am I loving God with all my mind? Where's my attention? What am I thinking about? What do I have my mind fixed on? And love God with all your strength. Where am I spending my abilities? How am I using my God-given strengths and gifts? Because we all worship something. I think the question that Daniel wants us to ask ourselves is, who? And so from the first story, we ask ourselves, what will I not worship? And from the second story, we ask ourselves, who will I worship? I'd like to invite you to pray with me. 
Our gracious God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for stories that inspire us. And we thank you that every time we are inspired by such a story, it points us to our true Savior, the one who gave himself for us. We thank you, God, that you are faithful to us and you call us to love you with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we pray that in our own lives that we will find ourselves drawn to you by your Spirit. Lord, we thank you for this church and for the, the, the wonderful things that you're doing in our midst. And we thank you that through this difficult season, we've been able to stay together, whether it be online or in person, but just in terms of our worship, in terms of our spiritual growth, uh, we've been one, and we thank you for that. Lord, we pray for uh, the other churches in our community, that you watch over our brothers and sisters and, and flourish those congregations. We pray for this community where we live and for those who lead us. We pray for our nation. Lord, we know that there are many places where we need to be healed, and we ask that you continue to use leaders to bring healing and to be, bring wholeness. And finally, gracious God, I pray now that you please hear all of our silent prayers. For we make them one and all in Christ's name. Amen.
I'd like to invite you to stand for our benediction. Uh, friends, go in peace and have courage and do that which is good and what, that which is right. Return no one evil for evil, but in all things rejoice in the power and the presence and the peace of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.